chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Dad, you said you'd play catch with me. I yelled as my father walked past me to his office, where he spent most of his days when he wasn't at work. I'm sorry, bud. I've got to get these documents down for tomorrow's big meeting. We'll do it another day, okay? I frowned. That was the same excuse he always gave me and the same follow-up he always had. We'll do it another day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure we will, I thought. The longer I stood in front of his door, the more upset I became. I eventually huffed and puffed enough to the point where I stormed out of the house. I left for my go-to place when I was upset. The treehouse. To a 12-year-old kid, a treehouse was the perfect place for a kid to just get away from his problems and be a kid. It was Reese's and my place to go when we were sad, mad, or just bored out of our minds. It was our little getaway when things went awry in our lives. We also went there just to hang out. It was our spot. We had found the treehouse one day while looking through the woods for buried treasure. We didn't find any treasure, but we did stumble upon the treehouse. We climbed up the ladder and viewed the place from inside. Reese called it a dump but I saw the potential in it. I fixed her up, grabbing fold-up chairs, a rug, and a blanket to cover the only window in the wooden box to create the coolest treehouse ever. We kept our comic books, Yu-Gi-Oh cards, and other miscellaneous knickknacks up there. Now that I got the treehouse out of the way, let me explain to you who Reese is. Reese is my best friend. He moved in next door when I was in the second grade. We went over to the house and introduced ourselves. I went into Reese's room and saw that he had a Nintendo 64. We sat down and played Super Smash Brothers all day, and that first visit became a sleepover, which we spent staying up late playing video games till our eyes became sore and then some. Reese was a good kid. Sure, he'd get into trouble occasionally, like the one time he fed his sister's goldfish to the cat, but he was overall a good kid. He'd get into trouble for sneaking out, and he constantly was a wise-ass to teachers, but again, he was a good kid. And most importantly, my best friend. My only friend. That day, Reese was on the last day of his grounding. He was caught sneaking out at night. I was supposed to sneak out as well, but I got cold feet and stayed in bed. Reese went to the treehouse alone, and when he realized I wasn't there, returned home where his parents caught him trying to sneak back in. Reese would always tease me, clucking and calling me a chicken when I did stuff like this. I was sure that once he got loose from the confines of his room, he'd be all up in my ear about it. I entered the woods and was making my way to the treehouse. I was about three quarters of the way there, swinging a stick I found a while back, pretending it was Excalibur, when I saw it. It was a black hole the size of a bowling ball, levitating at eye level a few feet away from me. It looked like someone took a picture and punched a hole through it, leaving a black spot in its place. I approached it curiously. I tried to go around it to get a side view of the thing, but it just disappeared. I walked behind where it would have been, and it reappeared. The hole was paper thin, and couldn't be seen from its sides. I looked at it intensely, trying to see anything inside. I looked down at Excalibur and lifted it upwards. I slowly inserted the stick into the black hole. Suddenly, like a vacuum, the hole absorbed the stick, forcing me to let go. I fell backwards on my rear end, kicking my legs out and skittering back at a feeble attempt to create distance between the black hole and me. I breathed heavily as I stared at the hole in astonishment. Then... The stick was spat back out and fell at my feet. I was frozen in place for a good minute. I didn't know what to do. Then, I had an idea. I ran over to a tree and grabbed an acorn off the ground. I went up to the hole and chucked the acorn in. I waited a minute, and then the acorn came out, whizzing past my head. Oh, I said. That's when I had another idea. 
I went home and grabbed the football from my bedroom, just in case my dad decided he ever wanted to play catch with me. I brought it to the black hole, got into a throwing stance, stretching my arm backwards, winding up the shot, and then threw. Of course, I missed the hole completely. I ran and grabbed the ball, got closer to the hole, and threw it underhand. This time, it went in. The minute passed and then the ball popped right back out and bounced a few times before it rolled up close to me. I smiled and prepared another throw. I got into the stance, stretched my arm backwards, and chucked it as hard as I could. This time, the ball went in no problem. A minute went by, and I just stood in front of the hole. The ball suddenly came out fast, spiraling and hitting me dead in the stomach. I fell to my knees in shock and pain. I wasn't expecting it to come out that hard. That's when I realized that it all depended on the strength of my throw. If I threw it weakly, the hole would toss it back with the same momentum. Throw it hard, and it would come back hard. I played catch with the black hole for a good hour and then made my way home. I couldn't wait to show Reese. The next day arrived. It was Sunday, so after Reese got back from church, I was ready to show my friend the coolest thing ever. When my friend got back home, I quickly ran over to his house and asked his parents if he could hang out. They said, of course, and we went to the treehouse. Dude, I have something amazing to show you, I said, hyped for my friend to see my cool find. Yeah, yeah, sure you do, he responded. We walked about three quarters of the way and started to approach where I'd seen the black hole. That's when Reese spotted it. Whoa. What the hell is that thing? It's a portal, I eagerly said. We looked at it for a good minute and then made our way closer. Throw this into it, I said, unable to hold back the excitement in my voice. I handed him the football and he brought his arm back and threw it in on the first try. I was a little envious, but I had to remember that Reese played baseball, so his aim was better than mine. Now what? He asked. Just wait. A minute went by, even though it felt like an eternity, and the ball finally popped back out and landed on the ground in front of Reese. Reese didn't say anything for a moment, then knelt and picked up the football. He scrutinized it carefully, looking for any scuffs or nicks on the ball. That was pretty amazing, he said in a monotone. I smiled, grabbed the ball back from him, and threw it into the hole once again. We played for a good 30 minutes. At first, Reese wanted to know how many things could go through the hole. He threw rocks, acorns, even a worm into the hole. All came back just like they had before. Then, we took turns tossing the football into it. What's on the other side? Reese finally asked. I don't know, space stuff? What if there was like a whole another dimension on the other side of it? Maybe there's, maybe there's an alternate version of us. I tossed the football into the portal again and waited for its re-emergence. Yeah, I guess it's possible. Aren't you at all curious what's on the other side? I thought for a moment. Um, yeah, I guess I'm a little curious. Well? Well, what? I asked, confused. Stick your head through the portal. What? No way, I said, backing up as if to say no with my body. Come on. Don't be a chicken like you were the other night. There it was. The chicken comment. I knew it was coming. I don't care what you say, I'm not doing it, I said, not letting peer pressure get the best of me. Every time he pressured me into doing something, we always ended up in trouble. That's when he began to cluck, bending his arms into his torso to resemble a chicken's wings. Chicken, 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 he chanted. Look, I'm not doing it. You don't know what could be on the other side. What if there's a monster or something? Come on, man. It's just a portal. Don't you want to know who's been tossing the ball back through it? I didn't think about that aspect of it. I guess there could have been someone on the other side, catching the ball and tossing it back to us. 
but I still didn't budge in my decision. Pussy, he finally shouted, which hit hard. He'd never called me a pussy before. I didn't even know that word was in his vocabulary. I knew the word too, but I'd never dare say it. He began to walk around the portal and I shouted to him, What are you doing, Reese? I'm going to look through the portal. I quickly followed him, trying to explain that it was a bad idea, but he wasn't having any of it. Look, you can't be a chicken your whole life. You gotta take chances sometimes. Plus, I want to know who, or what, has been on the receiving end of our passes. Don't you? Uh, I guess, but I don't think it's safe to just poke your head into things you don't understand. Pussy, he said, then bent forward to stick his head into the hole. He hesitated at first, maybe to take in what he was about to do, then plunged his head into the hole. A few long seconds later passed by and nothing happened. He just stood there, arms limp at his sides, looking through the hole. I looked around nervously, like we were doing a bad deed and I was on watch. Then, everything happened at once. Reese fell backwards, hitting the ground hard. I stood right behind him and was hit by something warm and wet, as if someone sprayed me with a super soaker filled with hot water. I looked down at the ground. He was missing his head. His neck leaked copious amounts of blood all over the place. That's when I realized that I was covered in blood. I screamed a scream only a kid could make. Then, something flew out of the portal, and I instinctively caught it as it slammed into my chest. I looked down at the thing in my hands and screamed again. It was Reese's head. His face was twisted in horror, like he'd just seen a ghost. His tongue lolled to the side and his eyes were glazed over. A white, milky film covered his barely visible pupils. Memories started flooding into my head. Thoughts of the times Reese and I would play hooky from school. The times we'd sneak out and would tell scary stories to each other in the treehouse, trying to make the other piss his pants. All the fond memories I'd ever had of Reese came together all at once and were shattered with one new, horrifying mental scar. My hands began to tremble and I dropped Reese's head to the dirt and ran away. I kept running till I made it home. I opened the door and slammed it behind me, then ran to the restroom to wipe Reese's blood off of my face. I spent half an hour scrubbing Reese's blood from my face, and another scrubbing the blood off my clothes. I was petrified. I walked out of the restroom and ran up the stairs to my bedroom. I got into bed, even though it was only six o'clock, and lay there, mortified. My eyes were wide open, looking straight at the ceiling, staring into space. The image of Reese's body dropping to the ground and his head landing in my arms kept playing over and over in my head. And then, after hyperventilating for a good ten minutes... I fell asleep. My dad woke me up. I opened my eyes and thought to myself, oh, that was one weird ass dream. But my father knocked me out of that thought when he asked me if I knew where Reese was. Apparently he didn't come home, and his parents thought that maybe he was over at my place. They filed a missing persons report the next day, thinking that maybe Reese had run away. After a few days went by, the police decided to do a search of the woods. They spread out and found his decapitated body on the woodland floor. Local news played the story everywhere. They were looking for his killer and asking anyone who had any information to call the local police department. I picked up the phone a few times, mostly to clear my conscience, which was eating me alive, but I didn't because I knew that no one would believe me. Who would? Hey, my best friend stuck his head through a portal and it bit his head off. Yeah, I'm sure that would be taken seriously. 
After all this time, one question remains with me, though. What did my friend see on the other side of that portal? My grandfather was an inventor. All his life he had been tinkering with something, either taking something that existed and changing it, making it into something brand new, or at the very least different, or inventing something entirely from spare parts. And while nothing he invented was ever earth-shaking, it was one of my greatest delights, ever since I was a little kid, to see what he'd made. Childhood visits to his home would always begin or end with me sitting on the couch, a look of absolute fascination on my tiny face as he showed off whatever gadget he had put together in his workshop this time around. It was like having my own personal Santa who worked all year round to fill my eight-year-old mind with wonder and glee. My older sister was likewise excited, no matter how much she tried to hide the excitement it filled her. Probably in an effort to appear cooler or more mature than myself. And while because of real life getting in the way, the visits became fewer and fewer, the older we got. We would always make time to see him at least a few times a year, and every time he would have something new to show us. He really was a genius. I should add, this isn't meant to imply something horrible happened to him. I'm sure some days he wished it had. That it had been him who had wound up in that hospital instead of my sister, but... No. He went in his sleep, and I hope that his passing was a peaceful one. Even all these years later, I can't bring myself to be angry about what happened. I can't bring myself to hate him. He had no idea what would happen, no clue how things would pan out. He knew something was wrong, yes, but he wasn't some doddering old fool. He knew the first time he looked through them that something was wrong, but he thought it was something only a little odd. Something unsettling and curious, perhaps, but not anything dangerous. Not anything that would harm anyone. I think, deep down, he just wanted to know that he wasn't crazy. He wanted to be sure that he wasn't seeing things. And who can blame him? Myself, my girlfriend Jessica, and my sister Joan. We were both used to our grandfather being bursting with energy to show us whatever he'd put together. So, his oddly subdued mood when he came to the door to greet us came a bit of a surprise. I was a little disappointed, in fact. I'd been hoping Jessica would get to share in the experience of having a new invention demonstrated before our eyes. We'd only started dating that year, so it'd be the first chance she got to see the kinds of things I'd been telling her about. The day passed pleasantly enough as we chatted, enjoyed food, and watched the television together. I think it was Joan who asked him, finally, if he had anything special to show us today. We knew that he had been working on something, as while this was the first time we'd seen him in person in a while, we'd both spoke to him on the phone in the preceding months, and he'd eagerly explained to us that he was working on something he thought would be quite extraordinary. I still couldn't tell you how he made them. I wouldn't even if I could. I tell you what his original idea for those oddly colored circles of glass had been. Before that fateful day, he'd looked through them and seen what he'd seen. He never shared details of his work with us beforehand, as he wanted it to be a surprise, and afterwards I think he was terrified of the thought of anyone replicating what he'd made. All I know is that when Joan pressed him to reveal his latest invention, he looked nervous in a way I'd never seen him before looked as if he was deeply troubled by something. He hesitated before speaking, as if not sure he would say anything at all before explaining to us that the nature of what he had been working on had changed after an unusual event, and that he wasn't sure if it would be a good idea to show us the end result. Now, we may have grown since the days when we would perch on his knee, but whether someone is two years old or in their twenties, the surest way to make them want something more is to tell them they can't have it. So, his reluctance, which at the time I'm sure we both thought was feigned, and heightened the suspense before the unveiling, just made us both want to see his invention more than ever. With a little persuading, he agreed, and left to fetch it. He came back a few moments later with what appeared to be a pair of glasses, with one big difference. 
The lenses were like no glasses I had ever seen before. I can't even describe the color of it without resorting to words like reddish or greeny, as they didn't seem to be exactly any color that we would have names for. In fact, they didn't seem to be exactly any one color at all. As if you tilted them one way and they would look different to you if you tilted them another. I know full well that probably sounds more like magic than something a well-meaning old man could put together in his humble little workshop, but that's what they were. Joan asked what they did, and her grandfather paused for a few moments, as if not quite certain how to answer. In the end, he told us that we really had to put them on for ourselves, as he was certain neither of us would believe him if he told us. Joan wanted to put them on first, but as she lifted them off the table, he reached out and grabbed her hand. He cautioned her that it might be startling at first, but that she wasn't in any danger and that if she got frightened, she could just take them off. He warned her that what she was about to see may not make any more sense to her than it did to him, but that we were all safe. I could tell Joan was a little scared. She always was lousy at hiding how she felt from people, and even I was feeling a bit unsettled by our grandpa being so uncharistically ominous about the whole thing. Joan slipped the glasses on, and we waited. She gasped, and for the next few moments she looked puzzled more than anything. Her lips moved wordlessly, and I thought I caught a... No, that's not right. Under her breath, as she seemed to look around at something none of us could see. And then she began screaming. I don't know if you've ever heard someone scream in horror in real life. I can promise you this, it's not like in the movies. The movies don't convey the awful sound of someone you love screaming their lungs out, making a noise more like an animal than a human being. It can't make you feel the things I felt in that moment, watching Joan yank the glasses from her head and hurl them across the room. And nothing could have prepared us for the sight of Joan beginning to claw her own eyes, screaming louder than anyone should be able to scream as she did. It took all three of us to restrain her at first. When we had her pinned down so she couldn't hurt herself anymore, Jessica and my granddad held her that way while I called for an ambulance. I had to watch as she was strapped down and wheeled into the back of one, thrashing and hissing and shrieking like some mad animal, like something utterly consumed by fear with no way out. I explained what happened, knowing full well how it made me sound. Jessica and I both explained the series of events that led to the skeptical, if not totally disbelieving, hospital staff and then to the specialist called in when nothing sort of being tranquilized proved effective at stopping my sister from trying to hurt herself. The glasses had supposedly gone missing, which made proving what had happened difficult, and it wasn't until almost a year later, long after my sister had been committed, that my grandfather finally confessed to me what he destroyed them. I don't know if anything could have helped, could have given the doctor some way to make things right. I doubt it somehow, and I can't truly blame him for doing what he did, given that it was an act born out of guilt and honest desire to make sure this didn't happen again. When he told me that he destroyed them, I asked what those glasses had done to her. He hadn't wanted to talk about it, and for the first time in my life, I raised my voice to him angrily demanding to know. After all this time, just what had driven my sister to this state? What had affected her so deeply, so profoundly, that she was now no longer even recognizable as the person I'd grown up with? He took me to his workshop and began digging around through the bits and pieces that littered the place, the half-finished and now long-discarded invention still awaiting completion. He produced two pieces of glass, rather like the ones that had been fitted onto those glasses. He told me that there wasn't any way to describe it without sounding insane. That if I had to know, then I had to see. But he begged me not to do this. That knowing wouldn't make things any better. He was right. I held the glasses up to my eyes, and in an instant, everything changed. Instead of just... My grandfather stood before me, 
Now there were dozens more in the room with us. But they weren't people. They were pale and emaciated, hunched over and dressed in dark clothing, with black lips and wide, lidless eyes that seemed to almost bulge from their skulls in a manner both comical and horrifying. Their mouths were full of hundreds of thin teeth, like needles. Their fingers were grotesquely long and ended in dark and viciously pointed nails that scraped along the floor as they walked. And all of them were talking, or rather, their lips were moving soundlessly. Each and every one of them was trying to say something that couldn't be heard. Dozens upon dozens of voices trying to convey something. I dropped the glasses to the ground in shock, and my grandpa brought his foot down on them hard, grinding them to powder underneath his foot, muttering that he should have done this in the first place. He put an arm on my shoulder asking if I was alright. I was far from alright and he had been correct. What I had seen made things worse, not better. It took me a while to work it out, of course. Why this had such a horrifying effect on my sister, and yet I had survived the experience. Frightened but not sporting the mental scars it had given her. The glasses only see the creatures. I couldn't hear what they were trying to say to me. Couldn't understand the message they were trying to impart. But my sister was deaf. She could read their lips. As kids, my sister Cassie and I didn't know we were different. How could we? We spent all of our time in the house. Our parents never let us play outside. They said this was for our own protection. I remember clearly our father outlining all the horrors of the world beyond our front door. Vicious animals, dangerous men, deathly illnesses. Every day brought a new reason why we couldn't venture outside the walls of the house. I realized the truth much later. They were embarrassed of us. Cassie and I were close. Literally and metaphorically. We spent every moment together. I've read that twins are often this way. But we were more than that. We woke up at the same time, closed our eyes for bed at the same time. We would often dream the exact same dream. We read books together. She'd read the left page and I'd read the right. Our parents said we were unnaturally close. This didn't make sense to us at the time. When we played, we would stick two toys together at the head, gummy see-through tape obscuring their faces. We would walk the one-headed doll in staccato movements, Cassie moving the left leg, me moving the right. Soon all of our toys were paired up. The stuffed pig was taped to the alligator, the china doll was matched up with a plastic dinosaur. Cassie and I even went so far as to glue our pillows together. So they'd never be lonely, I told our outraged mother. Despite our bond, Cassie and I were very different. I was perfectly fine obeying all of our parents' rules, although they were plentiful. Cassie, on the other hand, hated the rules. Even the small ones like brushing our teeth at night would send her into a fit. I liked mother's dresses she would make for me, but Cassie ripped at them with her teeth. Cassie was also nonverbal. It wasn't her fault, she just couldn't get her mouth to move the way the rest of ours did. This didn't mean we couldn't communicate. In fact, Cassie and I spoke constantly, always in our mind. Yuck, I hate bananas, she'd tell me in the morning as our mother served breakfast. Shut up, Cassie. I turned and smiled at mother. Thanks for breakfast. Cassie growled under her breath. You're such a suck up. We're prisoners here and you treat them like angels. They're our parents. Mother could always see we were arguing in our head. She never commented on it, though. I don't think she wanted to know what was going on between us. When we were younger, I noticed that Cassie and I didn't look like the kids in the picture books. These kids were alone. But Cassie and I were always together. I asked Father about it, and he told us we had a condition. You're sick, he said sternly. 
but the doctors can't separate you. It would kill her. He would like me to die, Cassie whispered in her head. Of course he wouldn't. He loves you. But he didn't. I knew this secretly. Our parents didn't do much to hide the fact that they favored me. They viewed Cassie as dead weight. And as we got older, I have to admit that I started to understand their opinion. She was difficult. She was always upset over something. Plus, she was the reason I wasn't allowed outside or able to have any friends. Around the age of 12, our parents started letting us use the computer. It was only supposed to be for our studies, but when we were alone, we tried to Google ourselves. Twins who share a brain. The first article was about twins who eat each other in the womb. This clearly wasn't relevant. The second was about Siamese twins. We skipped this one because we were from America. Then we got to the third one, which had a picture. Two grown women who shared a head. One woman was large and the other was small. It looked a little like Cassie and I. The article called them conjoined twins. It said that although the women wished they could be separated, the doctors ruled it was too dangerous. That's us, I said to Cassie. Why would anyone want to be separated? She responded. Maybe so they could look like normal people. I would much rather be with you than be normal. I paused before saying, Me too, Cassie. But that was all before Cassie was killed. She died of suffocation. We were 14. I knew the second she stopped breathing. I could feel a shiver in my entire body, as if something was crawling down my nerves. I started screaming. I didn't intend to, but the reaction was involuntary. Maybe it was Cassie screaming through me. My mother appeared in our bedroom as if she'd already been inside. My father was close behind. They rushed us. Me. To the hospital. It was the first time I felt night air on my face. Any fear about being outside evaporated. It was freedom. I saw men and women of all different races. They crowded around me, staring at me like a wild animal. I didn't care. It was bliss. I even forgot about the corpse of my sister hanging off of me. No one tried to resuscitate Cassie. Even though I knew she was dead, there was not a single attempt to save her life. The only thing the doctors did was prep me for surgery. Mother and father stroked my hair. They told me they loved me. That soon, this would all be over that the doctors would remove the tumor. The tumor that was my dead sister. I woke up some time later with the oddest sensation of weightlessness. My eyes were barely open, but I could see my parents asleep on a nearby couch. I was hooked up to a number of machines. I looked over and realized I was alone. The normal feeling of Cassie's body next to mine was gone. I was in a twin-sized bed. Logically, I knew what happened. Cassie died, and so they removed her from me. But the shock of the lack of her made my heart race. This thing I had secretly wanted, quietly yearned for, was terrifying. I lay back and moved my head around. It was so strange being able to move freely. There was no extra body to hinder me. Flatingly, I wondered where her corpse was. Was it lonely? Was I lonely? I lifted my hand hesitantly and felt the flesh that had once connected me to Cassie. In its place was a large scar and ray stitches. All that was left of my sister was empty air. It didn't feel real. I had only been conscious a few minutes and already panic was setting in. This was a mistake. What happened to Cassie? Where was she? I needed her. Desperately, I whispered, Cassie, are you there? A minute ticked by. Silence. Then a massive wave of screams filled my brain. It was Cassie's voice. 
igniting my mind with a thousand horrified shrieks. My eyes stuck wide open. Cassie's voice began to speak through the screaming. They killed me! They killed me! They killed me! Shut up! I yelled. My parents rose from sleep. I realized I had said this out loud. They came to me, trying to soothe my fears, but all the while Cassie was tormenting me. They murdered me! I tried not responding to the voice, but it didn't matter. Cassie didn't care if I spoke back. For days, she just kept lamenting her death as the doctors tried to teach me how to stand and walk without Cassie. She made herself known in my head. I pretended to be fine, but the voice tore through my sanity. I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, she'd start up again. It was them, our filthy parents. They put a pillow over my mouth and killed me. I didn't tell anyone about the voice. Who would understand? Soon I was clear to go home by the doctors. My parents made arrangements for me to start attending school. They bought me a wig to cover up the disfiguring scar. The doors were all unlocked now. There was no more hiding. It should have felt like heaven, but instead the voice of my sister haunted my mind. Dead. I'm dead. They killed me. Months passed with the same agonizing existence. I lost weight. I barely slept. Nothing could bring me any happiness. Cassie was slowly driving me insane. I didn't know if this was my imagination or if Cassie was really alive somewhere in my brain. But one day, I'd had enough. I couldn't do it any longer. They killed me. Our parents murdered me. Cassie was sobbing against my eardrums. I took a deep breath and said, Cassie, you have to stop. I put a hand over my mouth in surprise. I hadn't spoken in my brain, only out loud. I tried again. Stop it, Cassie! Desperately, I shoved my fist in my mouth to stop myself from talking, but nothing came out. The ability to speak through my mind had died with my sister. I crawled into a corner of the bedroom, arms over my head. I started to sob. Waves of horror and sorrow careened across my body. Cassie just kept screaming and screaming. Our parents are filthy monsters. They murdered me so they could have a normal daughter. They smothered me with a pillow. They, they didn't kill you. I did. I shrieked. Cassie's voice suddenly stopped. My tears kept coming. In a whisper, I continued. I couldn't live like that anymore. I wanted to be normal. I could still feel the weight of the pillow as I shoved it onto Cassie's face. I remembered the moans for help. I could still feel her clawing at my arm. Then something changed. I felt woozy and looked down at my body. It seemed like I was floating away from it. My being shrank. I felt myself pull out of my arms and legs, up into my torso finally lodging into the back of my brain. There was a tiny ball of myself, hidden, somewhere deep. My arm raised slowly. My arm? Her arm. My voice spoke out loud, but it wasn't me talking. Finally, you admit it. Terrified, I tried to call out, What's going on? but it was just my head. Our head? Just because he killed the body doesn't mean we don't still share the brain. My voice came up crackled. I was waiting for you to do it. I knew you would. You are just like our parents. Filthy, disgusting monsters. But I've always been stronger and smarter than you. You killed the body, but I still control the brain. Cassie stood up in my body, shaking out my limbs. I desperately tried to control anything, but she was right. She was stronger than me. It's strange being able to talk, she said out loud. I like it more than I thought I would. 
What are you going to do? I am going to become you. The prettier one. The one our parents wanted. Then I'll kill them. Maybe I'll staple their skulls together. Remember how they hated when we did that to our toys. And the best part is, I'll still have you. Stuck there in the back of our brain. She laughed. <laughs> I always said we'd never be separated. This was seven years ago. Our parents are long dead now. She never went through with her promise to staple their heads together. Instead, she used our glued together pillow to suffocate both at once. I had to watch, completely helpless. It was my hands over their mouths, just like I did to Cassie. You might wonder why she let me write this. This is supposed to be my confession. One of the ways she can torment me. She allows me to control the body for minutes at a time, giving me a taste of freedom before snatching it back. I should have known I couldn't ever get rid of her. She is a part of me. And now, I'm stuck here. Forever. I wish I had never murdered my sister. But... She sure seems happy that I did. The third time the police arrested me for child abuse, I tried to run from the crime scene, my son's bedroom, still clenching my boy's blood-soaked sheets. Officer Wallace slapped on the cuffs then threw me into the back of his car as the paramedics were loading my emotional seven-year-old into an ambulance. Strapped to the gurney, face awash in gore, eyes wide, he reached out with both hands, breaking the paramedic's restraints. Daddy! Daddy! I slammed my shoulder into the cruiser's door and screamed. It was no use. Seconds later, the ambulance pulled away in one direction, then the cruiser went in another while I continued thrashing around in the back, cursing the witness. Wallace stared into the rear view, paying more attention to me than to the foggy road ahead of him. After a while, I calmed down and closed my eyes. I knew what kind of treatment awaited me. There was nothing I could do but play the game. At the station, Wallace and his partner showed me photos of my boy's bedroom. The brand new white sheets I had just purchased for him were stained bright red. Pools of crimson spread across the floor where the blood had flowed over the edge of his mattress. The walls looked as if they had cried red tears. Stalactites of slaughter hung in congealed masses from the ceiling. Complete carnage. No one should have survived. And yet, my boy did. I rolled my eyes, then slammed my chained fists on the table. It's not the first time. You aren't showing me anything I haven't seen before. Hatred burned in Wallace's eyes, the kind reserved for subhuman waste or disease-spreading rats. You hurt him in the past? Or are you saying you've hurt other children? He jumped up from his chair, grabbed my t-shirt, and stood within an inch of my face. The corners of his eyes spasmed as he clenched his jaw, baring his teeth. Give me a reason, you sick freak. Give me a reason. I knew then what kind of man I was dealing with and laughed, despite myself. A reason? Fine, how's this? Those pictures are mild in comparison to last time. And the time before that. And the time before Wallace's partner whispered, What in God's name did you do to that poor child? Without turning away from Wallace, I said, Not another word until you let me see my boy. Wallace threw me back down into the chair. Get this piece of shit out of my sight! I sat up straight, smoothed my blood-splattered t-shirt, and did my best to keep a smug grin on my face. Being the monster they wanted wasn't easy, but I knew from experience he would likely hurt me if I tried to play the concerned innocent father card. The whole time I'd been thinking about my boy swarmed by social workers and doctors. Luckily, he knew better than to talk. Daddy had taught him well. After a sleepless night on a hard cot stinking of piss, Wallace's partner called my name and let me out of the holding cell. The paper he handed me had been stamped in red with the words, Charges Dropped. 
I collected my belongings, made a few quick phone calls, then stood outside waiting for a taxi in the thick morning fog. It had rained again, and the light mist blowing in the wind cooled my face. Freedom felt great. I couldn't wait to find my boy. Wallace came running out of the police station. I knew he wanted to rough me up, or worse. For fifteen minutes, he stared daggers into the side of my head. Finally, he said, The captain let you free, and he wouldn't tell me why. I nodded. Wallace took a step back. I don't know what the fuck is going on, but this isn't over. I nodded again, knowing exactly what he thought of me, knowing how confused and angry he would be without answers. Out of the corner of my eye, I watched him seething and wondered if the next time he put his hand on his service weapon, he was going to shoot me in the back of the head. The taxi pulled up. I let out a relieved sigh and climbed inside. Hospital, quick! The driver went to pull away. Well, no, wait, I said, and the car came to a stop. I wound down the window. Follow me if you want to see something. Wallace nodded, his face giving nothing away. I took the blank expression to mean he still wanted to kill me. I nodded back, smiled, then tapped the door, signaling the driver to go. At the hospital roundabout, my boy waited outside in a wheelchair, smiling. Two women in scrubs stood behind him, pale and visibly frightened. The second I exited the taxi, my boy, looking good as new, ran and jumped into my arms. The two women approached me almost cautiously while Wallace edged along to the side, mouth hanging open. I hugged my boy as if I hadn't seen him in years. What'd you tell them? Nothing, Daddy. Are we going to have to move again? I nodded. It isn't your fault. The old lady next door heard your screams before I could mask them. Wallace shook his head. He was... I saw... The how... One of the boy's doctors said, Once we cleared away all the blood, the other finished. We couldn't find a mark. Not a single cut, scratch, or bruise. Far as we can tell, he's a perfectly healthy little boy. My boy tugged at my sleeve. Can we go, Daddy? Yeah. I climbed into the taxi, still holding him tight. Wait. Wallace leaned in the window. Is this some sick joke? I saw what you did to that child. I saw the room. I closed my eyes. As you can see, he's perfectly fine. That doesn't make any sense. I never said it would. You told me you've done worse, made it clear you've hurt other kids. I have that on tape. Listen to your tape again. I said I've seen it happen before. Wallace narrowed his eyes. Think you're smart? Throwing animal blood over a kid, mentally torturing him? That's enough to put you away. He smiled, leaned closer, and whispered, Even if it isn't, I won't let this go. I'll stop you myself. I hugged my boy tighter, remembered how sour events can turn when some would-be hero has it out for you based on preconceived notions and tinfoil hat theories about a child's well-being. My boy lost his mother to a vigilante, murdered to protect him from harm that she never inflicted. Since then, I've learned to adapt. My act at the supposed crime scene, my attitude at the station, the invitation for Wallace to follow, even what I would say to him next, calculated damage control. All of it to protect my boy. You want me dead, but you aren't the first person that's threatened me and my boy. I would tell you to leave it to the caseworkers, but, officer, have you taken a look around? Wallace turned toward the doctors. Where are they? Where's that man from social services? One of the doctors swallowed hard. Gone. Said there was nothing he could do. I bit my thumbnail, wondering how many more times I would need to deal with a situation like this. Tell him what you found, please, doctor. The doctors looked at each other, then at Wallace. We thought it had to be animal blood, one of them said. It wasn't, the other added. The blood is definitely human. It's my boy's blood, I said, and they know it. Both doctors nodded. Yes, we triple-checked, one of them said. The blood is a match for the child. The other stepped forward. Sir, we would like to keep him for some further tests. I sighed, 
No tests. Never again. Thank you both for cleaning up my boy. They nodded, then turned and walked back into the hospital, muttering something about devils and miracles. Wallace seemed to deflate. He knelt and stared at my boy. The rain had picked up again and it made it look as if he were crying. He opened his mouth, but I put up my hand. This has happened before so many times. He wakes up screaming and covered in his own blood, more than could fit in his little body. How am I supposed to believe this? I don't expect you to believe anything. I asked you here because I don't want you to be a problem for us. We need to move and change our identities again before the doctors send in their report. How often does it happen? Every few months. Sometimes every day of the week. It varies. The longest lapse was two years, four through six. When it happens, I clean him up. If we're caught, we leave. Fast. There are people who want to lock him up and study this. I can't let that happen. I look down at my boy. Besides, it's just an accident during the night. Nothing to be ashamed of, right, buddy? Right, daddy? I smiled. Wallace clicked his tongue. This is insane. Maybe so, but it's true. I press my palms to my boy's ears. I've been dealing with his condition since he was born. The blood used to terrify me, but it's not what scares me anymore. While waking him from the screaming, he's begun to speak. Wallace scratched his ear. He lowered his tone and said, What does he say? I press a little harder on my boy's ears. The blood debt will be paid. The blood debt will be paid. I took my hands away and nudged my boy playfully in the side. You ready to go home so we can pack? Ready! That's my boy. As the taxi pulled off, I thought about the 9mm backup plan locked in the safe at home. So far, I hadn't needed to take a life to protect my boy. I turned and nodded at Officer Wallace standing in the middle of the road, hoping that he'd stay away. He faded into the morning fog until there was nothing left except a clean, white sheet of mist. I'm not sure what to say. This all happened rather suddenly, although the last three weeks have been long and dragged out. <sighs> Let me tell you my story. I moved into my new house three weeks ago. I moved here to be closer to my friend Haley, whose mother wasn't doing so well. Only part of it was because my boyfriend and I were no longer getting along. There was nothing special about the house. Just a simple two-bedroom house that had an attic. I didn't really know the history of the house, nor did I really care upon moving in. <sighs> How I wished I did. It was only myself living there, so I turned the extra bedroom into a study. The bigger bedroom seemed much better for holding my bed and dresser anyway. I spent the first week unpacking. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary about the house. No damages needing to be fixed, no leaks. It made me wonder why the price tag was so low. Surely such a well-made two-bedroom house shouldn't have gone for only eight grand. But that is how much I paid for this house. The real estate agent only said that the last family had moved out with their 15-year-old son to be closer to family. Such a plain reason should have warranted more of a search, but I was just happy to have found such a steal. Like I said before, it only took a week to unpack my stuff. Everything was going great. I currently took college classes online, so the study was a great room to have some peace and quiet. Some strange things started to happen exactly nine days after I moved in. When I would lay down to sleep, I would hear this moaning sound. It sounded like an animal of some sort. I passed it off as something coming from outside, 
and ignored it as it continued over the next couple of days. However, the day after that, things just got too weird. I woke up to the smell of baby powder. It was faint in my bedroom, but it grew stronger when I entered the hallway. This was very strange, as I didn't own any baby powder. Not even any lotion that could have smelled similar, either. I was a little creeped out, but again dismissed it. The smell went away after a few hours later anyway. I continued through my day, cramming in nearly three days of classwork to my schedule. While I was writing my report on the biography of Van Gogh, I started hearing a noise. Like the song you hear coming from an ice cream truck. But it was different. Soon after, to my horror, I realized what it was. A baby mobile. My older sister had a baby, and the mobile in his crib sounded much the same as the sound I heard. Of course, the tunes were different, but that was definitely what it was. And the freakiest part? It was coming through the wall. But there was nothing next to this room, no bedroom, no bathroom, nothing. I left the study, moving out into the hallway. Just as I thought, the music stopped, and I shook my head. Okay, maybe I was studying too hard? <laughs> that had to be it. I was imagining things. For the next week, things returned to normal. Haley came over and we played some video games, and she stayed for dinner. I pulled the baked spaghetti from the oven just as she returned from the bathroom. What kind of music box did you buy? I like the tune it makes. She entered the kitchen, taking a seat at the table. Music box? I parroted. I don't own a music box, I replied, for I was drawing up in confusion. Are you sure? I heard this cute little tune. How did it go? She paused for a moment, before humming the tune she had heard. <laughs> and I almost dropped the spaghetti. The color flushed from my face faster than I could even process what I had just heard. That was the tune the mobile had made. Oh, well, I breathed. I started feeling faint. I placed the spaghetti on the counter, stumbling over to a chair and collapsing into it. Can you get me some water? I asked. I was going to be sick. I just knew it. Sure, May. What's the matter? Haley moved to get the water and I sipped it while waiting on my heartbeat to slow. After finishing half of the glass, I set it down. That tune... I heard it earlier, too, I said. It's not a music box, Haley. I won't know what it is. I... It, it sounds like a baby mobile. But the family who lived here before me didn't even have a baby. I then began to explain everything, about the smell and sounds I'd been hearing. Would you mind staying the night with me? I feel a bit uneasy now, I admitted. I felt relieved when she agreed. We ate dinner, and I took a shower while she set up the couch in my room to sleep on. Soon enough, I came back and lent her a pair of my pajamas, and we both turned in for the night. It was around three in the morning when Haley woke me. I was instantly awake, but it wasn't due to her prodding fingers. No, instead I had woken up to the sound of a baby, screaming and crying. What the hell? I exclaimed. Haley looked scared. Are you certain you don't have a baby? Do you hear that, May? Oh, I heard it all right. Haley... 
We have to find out what's going on or else I won't sleep ever again, I said. My mind was made up. I got out of bed, walking out of my room and turning the hallway light on. The screaming was coming from the opposite side of the hall, and I crossed the short distance to listen. The screaming carried on for a few moments longer, then ceased entirely. Get the toolbox from my closet. I may have to pay for the damages, but I won't get any peace of mind until I figure out what the fuck is going on around here. I was tired and shaky, but I couldn't go on like this. I needed to find out what was happening. Haley brought the toolbox over, and I looked through it before pulling my hammer out. I then stood back, swinging the hammer to hit the wall as hard as I could. Nothing happened, but I continued. I pounded at the wall, again and again, until a good part of it collapsed. I dropped the hammer, sinking to my knees. Oh my god. There was a bedroom. There was a bedroom, hidden behind this wall where nobody could see it. I stepped over the rubble, barely noticing that Haley was following me. It was a baby's nursery. Furniture took up the room, most of it caked in dust. It looked as if no one had touched it in a long time. A rocking chair sat in the corner, and a crib sat along the opposite wall. There were no windows either. A bookshelf was next to me, lined with toys and books. But not only that, a large book sat at the end. I plucked it from the shelf, wiping the grime and dust away to reveal the title. Baby's first year, it read. What is this? Haley wondered as she explored the room. I shook my head slowly as I opened the book. I didn't know. The first page had a picture taped to it. A black and white photo of a baby girl was taped to the page, and the name under was written as Olivia Bethany Cordell. The baby was cute, but she looked off, like she had a physical deformity of some sort. I couldn't say what kind. I flipped the page, finding a birth date listed. October 23rd, 1972. The following details aren't really important as I look at it now. Just ages of milestones and things like that. May? Haley was standing next to the crib, hand over her mouth, with a terrified expression masking her face as she peered into it. I dropped the book, going to stand next to her. I peered into the crib as well, and I went white with shock. Oh, God baby bones. They were fully decayed, but the whole skeletal structure was there. From the skull to the tiny bones, everything. That did it. We both left the house as fast as we could, going back to Haley's house. I couldn't take it. I couldn't stay there anymore. I spent the night taking the couch. The next morning was tense. Neither I nor Haley said a word, but I did borrow her computer. I decided to just throw caution to the wind, searching my address. I didn't find much, but I did find a news article. I started reading it, taking every word in. Here, I'll relay the article the best that I can. It has since been removed for reasons unknown to me. Family disappears, father found. Local authorities contacted, May 17th, 1972. The Cordell family of 1247 South Broadway Street went missing last Wednesday, after the neighbors reported screaming. When authorities arrived, the house was empty. The persons missing are David Cordell, 33, Patricia Cordell, 30, and Tate Cordell, 7. David was found and brought in for questioning three days ago, but the rest of the family has yet to be found. Cordell admitted to leaving his seven-month-old daughter, Olivia Cordell, who was diagnosed as a mongoloid, recently renamed to Down Syndrome, in the house. 
Police could not find the little girl upon searching the house, but the case is ongoing and is still being investigated. I have moved back into the house since then, and I am still living there today as I write this. I contacted the police and told them about the body, and they took the bones to be properly put to rest. I haven't had anything happen since, and I'm grateful for that. A terrible thing had happened here. A baby had been left to die, which she did, all because the room had been hidden. I decided to keep the room as it is, but I have had a contractor come out and repair the wall and install a door since then. Who knows? The nursery might make a great room for my baby in seven months. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. 